Welcome to this episode of World War II Wayfinder. I am stood on Lafayette Bridge, one of the most important objectives on D-Day, 6th of June, 1944. It was the actions here at Lafayette that really had the strategic, the big picture impact on D-Day. It was vital to ensure that both east and west banks of this river were seized by the Americans on D-Day. This would prevent the Germans from launching a counter-attack across the river and into the forces building up in the beachhead area from Utah Beach. It would also mean that the Americans then had the crossing point secured to enable those forces in the beachhead area to then push inland cut off the Contenting Peninsula and then head north towards Cherbourg. Now just to try and give you a little bit of an idea of the orientation, the layout of the land, I'm stood on the eastern bank of the Mer d'Oreille River. Over that way to Corquigny is the western bank. Looking down there toward the manor buildings, that's the south. And then as we come around here, up in this direction is the north. And that's just to try and help you orientate the lie of the land here, because there was so much fighting that went on in this small area and so many um, place names, village names, just to try and help paint that picture of whereabouts Lafayette stands in relation to San Maraglis over to the east, along with Utah Beach. The small hamlet of Corquigny sits over there on the western bank of the Mer d'Oreille. Further to the northwest is that of what would become known as Timmy's Orchard, and we'll look at that later on. Down to the south, in this direction, behind Lafayette Manor and following the direction of the Mer d'Oreille as it snakes through the French countryside, was the other bridge which was the objective of the 505th, and that was the Chef du Pont Bridge. Now the Chef du Pont Bridge, whilst important, it was another crossing over the Mer d'Oreille, it wasn't as vital as the one here at Lafayette. The bridge here at Lafayette was really considered to be the gold standard for the 82nd to capture and then to enable the forces from the uh, seaborne landings to then push westward and into the Cotentin Peninsula to enable that swing north towards Cherbourg. Because the Battle of Lafayette is far more than the action that took place at the bridge behind me, what we'll do, we'll look on the map and I'll show you some of the key features and some of the key areas that we're going to go and visit as part of this episode. So this is a 1 to 25,000 scale map, so it's um, pretty detailed. Here we've got the town of saint mary which was the 2nd and 3rd Battalion's objective. This area here was the drop zone for the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the drop zone. We then, down here right now at the bridge, and we've got the memorial. You can see the murder ray as it snakes its way um, north to south. This is the causeway, this is the 800 yard stretch of road, the elevated road, and this was the whole flooded area here. Then Corquigny, this is the tiny, tiny hamlet um, with the key feature being the chapel there. Uh, Omfreville, we're not going to go and look at Omfreville as such, but there is an important location um, around here called Timmy's Orchard, and I'll explain that, but that was uh, essentially where a battalion of paratroopers got cut off and they played an important part in the battle here. We've got the Sunken Lane, which also plays a key feature, and also Chef du Pont here. This was the other objective for the 505th, but it turned out that in the end, this one would really play second fiddle to the actions that took place in and around this whole area at Lafayette, Corquigny and the Causeway. So I'm now on drop zone O and this was the drop zone in these fields and these lanes around me where the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne would land on the morning of D-Day. They had the best drop of the whole division. Now you've got to remember the 505th had been in combat before. They had super experienced paratroopers acting as jump masters in their aircraft, they knew when they were over their drop zone. 
and when the green light needed to go on and get everybody out of the door. This was the area here of drop zone O, just to the west of San Mariglis. And in this area, it was where First Lieutenant John Red Dog Dolan managed to assemble approximately 90% of his men of A Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. When they did, they moved down this lane here and then started to make their way down toward Lafayette, unbeknownst to them that the Germans had already occupied this eastern bank of the murder ray. Now one crazy thing about Normandy is sometimes you get lucky and just pulled up here on the drop zone and there is still bits of shrapnel from the fighting that took place here 79 years ago. This was just lying on the side, um, side of the grass verge and it is a razor sharp piece of metal. So now I'm at Corquigny. This is the small, well, the tiny French hamlet on the western bank of the Merdere River. And if we spin around, we can see across this marshy fields, this would have been the flooded area. And then in the background is Iron Mike stood on the hill at Lafayette. Now Corquigny is tiny, but further out to the west are the towns of Omfreville and Picoville. And it was in this area that the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment was going to be responsible for taking the ground here, holding it, and then linking up with elements of the 505th on the eastern bank of the Merdere River. That way, they would take both ends of the causeway at the same time, securing it for the American forces coming off of Utah Beach. I'm stood on the outskirts of Omfreville, and this was the objective of Lieutenant Colonel Timmies on the morning of June 6, 1944. He assembled his men from the 507th and other stragglers to try and take this village as part of the wider 507th objectives for D-Day. However, coming up against this village, the German forces here turned it into a fortress. After a firefight, Timmy's men were repulsed and they then headed back in an easterly direction down this road here to their location that would then become known as Timmy's Orchard. This was where Lieutenant Colonel Timmies withdrew his men of the 2nd Battalion of the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment after their failed attack against the little village of Onfreville, just further to the west of this location. In these orchards, he and his men remained in defensive positions from the early hours of the 6th of June 1944 all the way through to the 9th of June 1944 when the forces coming across Lafayette Causeway managed to seize Corquigny and then get to this position and relieve Timmy's and his men here. One important feature here of the terrain at Lafayette and over to the western bank at Corquigny were these fields to my left. The Germans had learnt to flood this land, controlling the um, incoming water from the English Channel and the outgoing water at La Barquette Lock. By flooding this land, and it had been flooded for months, the grass had grown up through it, so when Allied aerial reconnaissance flew over, they weren't really able to tell that this whole area had been submerged by the floodwaters. Now, one key thing is it wasn't very deep. It was only about three feet. But if you landed in that area with all of your equipment and your parachute harness as well, and it's dark, and you're potentially being shot at, trying to get out of the American T5 harness was very difficult. It had buckled straps rather than the British quick release that's seen on the X-Type as used by British and Canadian forces. So several of the men who landed in the marshes, unfortunately, weren't able to get out of their harnesses in time and drowned in the flood water. It was one thing to lose the men in the flood waters. That was tragic. But what was a bigger concern for the operational element was the loss of the power packs, the power bundles from the C-47s that contain the men's heavy weapons, ammunition, and rations and medical supplies, sadly a lot of those were lost in those fields behind me. Now unbeknownst to the Americans, on the night of the 5th of June into the 6th of June, just as they were getting ready to end plane at their air bases in England, 28 Germans on a patrol decided that they were going to billet themselves in the manor at Lafayette. This couldn't have been known and this was completely unexpected when the Americans arrived in this area. The opening shots of the battle were fired in the early morning light when an MG42 in the manor's main house opened up on the troopers of Lieutenant John Red Dog Dolan's A Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. After making contact with the enemy, the 505th troopers attempted to flank the enemy by manoeuvring around to attack the north side of the manor 
In doing so, they ran into more small arms and machine gun fire. Shortly after, a force of 507th paratroopers, led by G Company commander, Captain Ben Schwarzfolder, joined the developing battle. Several units were simultaneously converging on the same objective in a very uncoordinated manner. So on the western side of Lafayette Manor is the flat floodplain, but on the eastern side is orchards, thick hedgerows and big earth mounds. It was this area that the 82nd would have to fight through to capture the manor. Now, this provided great cover and concealment for the Germans. And after moving only a short distance, Schwarzwalder's group came under fire from one of the same machine guns that had stopped Dolan's 505th troopers earlier that morning. Now, at about the same time, the regimental commander, Colonel Roy Lindquist from the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment, arrived on the scene with a group of troopers that included men from C Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. All of these units continued to converge on the objective until elements of the 505th and 508th were able to enter the manor grounds from the eastern side around the back of the buildings. Sporadic shots continued briefly and then one of Dolan's men fired an M1A1 bazooka into the stone house. Shortly after that, a 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment sergeant darted through the door and emptied a full magazine from his Thompson M1A1 submachine gun into the floorboards of the second story. What was left of the German forces there immediately surrendered and the battle for the manor at Lafayette was finally over. It was in this area after the capture of the manor that A Company Commander John Dolan then sighted his men of A Company 505th PIR in and around these grounds here. Now, it's somewhat hard to imagine given how well manicured and looked after this area is now, especially with Iron Mike stood proudly on the hill there. In 1944, it looked a lot different. The men were dug into their shell scrapes here in their foxholes to try and protect themselves as best they could from the German artillery on the western bank of the Merdere in their German positions behind Corquigny. Now, one thing that is of importance, ideally, nobody ever wants to sight their troops on a slope facing the enemy. Unfortunately, Dolan had very little choice and that's what he had to do with his men of the 505th. They were here in plain view of the enemy and between the 6th and 9th of June would receive a great deal of incoming artillery, mortar fire and small arms fire. So in the morning of the 6th of June 1944, Lieutenant Colonel Timmies would be held up with his men of the 2nd Battalion 507th in the area to the east of Omfreville after his failed attack there. Now that area would later become known as Timmy's Orchard, but at the time it was his defensive position where his men were able to secure the ground. Now he sent Lieutenant Levy and a few men to come to Corkigny to take and hold the area here. So Lieutenant Levy and his men made it here to Corkigny and they would be responsible for holding this hamlet and attempting to link up with the men of the 505th when they made it across the causeway. So Captain Schwarzwalder would bring a handful of men over from Lafayette at around 10.30 on the 6th of June 1944 in order to try and link up with the rest of the 507th that he was part of. He knew that this bank of the Merdere and of the causeway had to be taken, so he wanted to get back and get back to his original mission objectives. When he arrived here, he met up with Lieutenant Levy, left a handful of men to help bolster the defences here. He then headed to the northeast to try and find Lieutenant Colonel Timmy's in his defensive positions there. So at around half past three in the afternoon on the 6th of June, 1944, Levy and his men that were in the defensive positions here at Corquigny started to hear sporadic fire from small arms and as well as the rumble of tanks. It was at this point that the Germans smashed into the positions here at Corquigny. They knew the Americans were here and the men from the 1057 Grenadier Regiment, as well as the tanks from the Panzer Ersatz Ausbildung Abteilung, 100 came through these positions prior to their attack on the Lafayette Causeway itself. As the Germans overwhelmed the positions here, Levy and his men were then forced back across the causeway to try and reach the positions at the 505th over at Lafayette. So after kicking out Levy and the other Americans here from the positions at Corquigny, it was here then that the Germans assumed their defensive positions for the next three days of the battle. Now prior to the attack here at Corquigny, the Americans over there on the eastern bank had been getting shelled by German mortar and artillery fire that was much further back behind the lines from Corquigny over to the west. So by the late afternoon around 1600, the men of the 1st Battalion, 505th were all dug in along these banks. We had other members of the 507th and the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment on the other side of the manor buildings. It was around 1600 when the Germans started to launch their first attack against the bridge here and against the American defenders. So in the positions behind me, 
on that bank of the Murderay, we had PFC Leonard Peterson and Private Marcus Heim Jr. Peterson was the gunner on the bazooka and Marcus Heim was his assistant gunner or his loader. And then on that side of the bank, there was PFC John Balderson and his assistant gunner, Private Gordon Prynne. So at 1600, the Germans put in their big attack against the positions here. There were four tanks and about 200 infantry, all heading up this road from the little hamlet of Corquigny, where the Germans were garrisoned, heading this way toward the bridge at Lafayette. So the four German tanks were from the Panzer Ersatz und Ausbildungsabteilung 100. In the lead was a Panzer III, followed by two Renault R35s and a Hotchkiss H39. Behind them were the German infantry of the 1057 Grenadier Regiment that was part of the 91st Luftland Division. Now, what we have to remember, the Germans' delay in putting in this counter-attack here, leaving it so late on D-Day, was all thanks to another American paratrooper from the 82nd. That paratrooper from the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment had a great impact on the 91st Luftland's division ability to react to the American invasion here on D-Day. That's because he was able to kill General Falley, their commanding officer. And if you want to see more about that, you can find that video um, in my playlists. So as the German armour started rolling across the causeway, Peterson and Heim on the left-hand side, Balderson and Print on the right-hand side both sprung into action. They got out of their foxholes, came over the bridge and to about these positions here. As the first German tank approached the bridge, the tank commander halted the tank and made the fatal error of opening his hatch and getting out. At that point, he was cut down with a burst of machine gun fire from one of the 30 caliber gunners located on the other side of the Mare Array. At this point, they went to work. They started firing rocket after rocket into the advancing German tanks. Now, some of this was aided by the big 57 millimeter gun that was on top of the hill, but realistically, it was the two bazooka teams that managed to stop the tank advance here at the bridge. The first tank was stopped just roughly where that metal sign is, and then the other tanks further down. The rate of fire from the bazooka gunners and that combined with a small arms fire from the paratroopers dug in back where the memorial is located today, that was enough to halt the German attack and to push them back across the causeway. Now, for their actions on the 6th of June, 1944, Peterson, Heim, Balderson and Prynn were all awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. The Distinguished Service Cross being the second highest award for valor below that of the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, policy was back in the day that only one Medal of Honor could be awarded per division. That wasn't gonna to go to them, but considering they were all four draftees, they weren't volunteers in the paratroops, to all be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross is a massive sign of achievement and recognition of their actions here on the 6th of June, 1944. So it was approximately this position where the 57 millimeter anti-tank gun that had been brought in by gliders from the 325th um, on the early hours of June 6, 1944, had been brought to this position by members of the 307th Airborne Engineer Battalion. This gun was strategically placed here so that it could cover the approaches to the bridge. And during the bazooka action with Marcus Heim, Peterson and Balderson and Prynn, it would also feature heavily in the defense of the Lafayette Bridge just down there. Now, one other element of the battle here at Lafayette was the fact that General Gavin, the assistant divisional commander for the 82nd Airborne Division, was here in this foxhole observing the fighting. Now, that's not the case, but General Gavin was very much a leader who was up front with his men at the sharp end. Now, this foxhole here, I've known um, individuals who have said that They've found a lot of 30 cal rounds here um, over the past, and this was many, many years ago, and also General Gavin himself, and it doesn't get any better than this, stated that this was not his foxhole. But he did observe the battle from Lafayette, and there's also great photos of him with other officers from the 82nd Airborne in the manor grounds themselves. So he was very much a general who led from the very front, not from behind, but he was up there at the sharp end with his men, always carrying his M1 Garand into battle. As a result of the bazooka gunners actions here on the bridge, they had used up all of their rockets in taking out the German tanks. So resupply was put in, Major Kellum, the 1st Battalion commander, and Captain Royston, the operations officer, then went to go and get a resupply of bazooka rockets for them. Just as Major Kellum and Captain Royston returned with their resupply of bazooka rockets to the bridge here, the German mortars started to fire. 
One mortar round landed right next to Major Kellum, killing him instantly. Another round landed close by to Captain Roysden and knocked him unconscious, and sadly he would later die of his wounds on the 6th of June 1944. As a result of Major Kellum's death, First Lieutenant John Dolan, the A Company commander of the 1st Battalion 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, would then assume command for the 1st Battalion until the regimental XO, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Alexander, would arrive at the bridge later that evening on the 6th of June and assume command of the battalion. So after the Germans failed attack on the 6th of June 1944, they pulled back, continued to shell the American positions overnight and into the morning of the 7th of June. It was then back along the same causeway that the Germans tried yet another infantry assault against the American positions. The men of the 505th and the 507th were there at the bridge waiting for them and they cut the Germans down with heavy small arms fire. It was after this second failed attack by the Germans on the 7th that a temporary ceasefire was agreed between the Germans and the Americans to collect the wounded from both sides. It only lasted for half an hour and the Americans suspected another German counterattack would be put in as soon as the ceasefire finished, but the Germans just melted away and continued to shell the American positions for the remainder of the 7th and into the 8th of June. So on the 8th of June, Timmy's would start to launch offensive patrols out from his strong point here at Timmy's Orchard out towards Grey Castle, which was a chateau located further to the northeast from here, as well as Lapierre Farm. The battle raged all day, but the Americans were able to hold off the extreme German forces that were in this area. It was also on the 8th of June that Timmy's decided that action was needed. He needed to link his forces with higher headquarters and get back into the main body of the 507th Regiment. So he gave orders to First Lieutenant John Marr to try and link up with the friendly forces that he knew would be in the Lafayette area. So it was heading out in the direction behind me that Ma would travel. He would then hit the railway line that runs north-south from Cherbourg down to Carentan. He would then follow that south all the way to Lafayette and link up with Gavin's forces there. Upon reaching Lafayette, he would then explain the situation to General Gavin and the other officers there and that Lieutenant Colonel Timmy's and the men in Timmy's Orchard needed help. So when Ma made it back to Lafayette and linked up with General Gavin and was able to explain the situation of what had happened to Timmy's at the orchard on the western bank of the Murderay, Gavin put a plan in place to send Major Sanford and his 1st Battalion of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment with Ma escorting them back across the sunken lane to Timmy's positions. After a firefight at the Grey Chateau, the forces of the 325th linked up with Timmy's and then their plan was to then swing from there moving around Almfreville to then come in and attack the German positions at Corquigny from the rear. Gavin hoped that this would then free up his forces on the eastern bank of the Merderay to be able to then come across the causeway unopposed. However, the plan didn't play out the way he wanted it to. So after the 1st Battalion of the 325th moved out from Timmy's Orchard, A, B and C companies had planned to swing around and hit Corquigny in the rear. The problem was, moving through these hedgerows at night on the 9th of June, they struggled and some of them got lost and struggled to make their way toward their objective. As C Company was moving south in the fields behind me, they came under murderous machine gun fire from a German position. Pinned down, there was no way out for the men until PFC Charles de Glopper decided to take action. De Glopper was a big guy. He stood at over six feet tall and he was his platoon's BAR gunner, carrying the Browning automatic rifle. Seeing a gap in the hedge, he knew that the men could get out from there and get back into cover and get away from the German machine gun fire, but it would require him to keep the German heads down in order to do so. Standing up, he started to pour fire from his BAR into the German positions to suppress them. As he did so, his men were able to sneak through the gap in the hedge and get away and get to safety. He kept firing his BAR, but he was hit. Getting to his knees, he then continued to fire, but was yet hit again, firing all the time into the German positions. Eventually, he was killed, but the rest of his men had managed to escape. For his actions on the 9th of June 1944, Charles de Glopper of the 1st Battalion 325th Glider Infantry Regiment was awarded the Medal of Honour. Now, with the 1st Battalion's attack on the western side of the Merderay Causeway having failed on the early hours of June 9th 1944, Gavin was left with little choice. It was now that he had to put the 3rd Battalion of the 325th in to a direct frontal assault against the German positions directly across the Lafayette Causeway to Corquigny. The 3rd Battalion 325th was Gavin's plan B to capture Corquigny and secure the western bank of the Murderay. But knowing how tough the fighting had been here, he also needed a plan C. And that would be led by Captain Robert D. Ray 
of Service Company 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And he, along with a composite company, would be the follow-up force needed if the attack by the 325th stalled. In support of the 3rd Battalion 325th Glider Infantry Regiment and their assault on Corkin Yee across the causeway would be six 155mm from the 345th Field Artillery Battalion. They were located just up the road on the other reverse side of the slope here. At 10.30, they would put in a 15-minute preliminary bombardment of the German positions on Corkin Yee and on the western side of the Lafayette Causeway. So as soon as the bombardment lifted, G Company from the 3rd Battalion 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, led by Captain John Souls, would move his men out from that stone wall there, coming around over the bridge and heading in the direction of Corkigny. Now there was a big hole in that stone wall and after the first few men got around, the Germans saw what was happening and then the next guy who went across that gap was sadly shot and killed and this stalled the 325th assault. So as Captain Saul from G Company, the 325th, led his men across here, across the causeway, Immediately, as soon as they hit the road, they were under murderous small arms fire from the Germans dug in at Corkigny. They were getting hammered, and the men from E and F Company that were lagging behind after seeing one of their comrades shot through the hole in the wall at the manor, after they did eventually catch up, the small arms fire just meant that they had to dive into the ditches and take cover. So Sauls and his men from G Company of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment did make it to the hamlet of Corkigny and were able to kick the Germans out and secure the positions. Because of the amount of confusion going on during the 325th push across the causeway, Gavin, from his commanding position at Lafayette Manor, struggled to make out what was going on. Because it was of such vital importance that Corkigny and the western bank of the Merdere River was captured by the American forces, he had little choice but to send in Captain Ray and his composite company from the 507th PIR. Now hopefully this gives you a really good idea of the causeway and how high it is. It's probably about seven foot above the lie of the fields here. And it was here that the men of E and F Company from the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, during their assault on the causeway, started to take cover as they were cut down by machine gun fire. It was from these positions that as Ray's men of the 507th ran across, they gave encouragement to the men of the 325th, told them to get up and to follow them. It must be remembered that Captain Souls and the men of G Company of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment did make it here to Corkigny. They did clear the Germans out and they were able to secure the positions. Ray's charge was done as a result of the fog of war and that isn't to take anything away from his actions on that day. But it must be remembered that the Glider Infantry Regiment, the men of the 325th, they fought equally as hard as the paratroopers and deserve just as much recognition for their actions here on the 9th of June. I couldn't tell the story of the Battle of Lafayette and Corquigny without stopping here in the gorgeous little French village of Picoville and this magnificent memorial to the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment that landed in and around these fields here. Now, after Corquigny had been captured by the Americans, the fighting did continue in and around this area. Picoville and Onfreville, further on the road here, all of these villages were still heavily fought for from the 9th of June onwards until such a time as the 82nd and the 90th Infantry Division could clear out this whole area before the further push north up the Contenant Peninsula. Now one really good point about the memorial here at Picoville is the new memorial that's been placed here to Private Gandara from the 507th PIR 82nd Airborne. His action against the Germans like de Glopper, he took his BAR and advanced on the German positions on his own, firing into them, but was tragically killed. In March 2014, his award of the DSC was then upgraded by President Barack Obama to the Medal of Honor, and his memorial now rests here at Picoville. Without the actions of the men of the 505th, 507th, the 508th, and the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment here at Lafayette and over to the west at Corkin Yee, between the 6th and 9th of June 1944, the invasion forces coming off of Utah Beach could well have stalled and then the fight for the Contenant Peninsula would have lasted a lot longer. So I hope now you understand the importance of Lafayette Bridge and why the causeway here was such a vital objective for the 82nd Airborne on D-Day and the days after it. This battle gets so little coverage, yet it is one of the most important actions that took place from the 6th to the 9th of June 1944. Right, I'll see you all in the next one.